So welcome everybody to our August meeting of the Accelerating Innovation Committee. Um, we've got lots to talk about today with uh, some cross committee updates and then kind of looking at our portrait of a learner subcommittee update. Um, and then we're going to go back to our systems prototypes because you all have been doing a lot of conversations around different types of systems for a, a systems bank, a system of systems that could be a possibility for our future work. And then finally going to wrap up with some cross committee collaboration and what should we be prepared to share out to the other committees. And I don't know. Um, Susan, if you want to share that uh, link to the agenda, I don't know if sometimes Zoom is weird and it doesn't pop up if you came in after it was shared. You can share that link to the agenda one more time so everybody can take a look at it. So there's our agenda. And then we're going to go ahead and get started with Kathy reporting out from other committees and their updates this afternoon. All right. Hi, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Or be on Zoom with you. Uh, just the, the updates are very short. And if I forget anything, if anyone knows of anything that I've forgotten, please be sure and go ahead and just share it with us. Uh, since our last meeting, I'll start with the Bold New Futures. Uh, since our last meeting, the Bold New Futures did make their presentation to the Kentucky Board of Education at, at their board retreat, retreat, which was last week. And uh, that presentation went really well. Uh, if you haven't been able to see it online, you can go online. It is available online. It was not live streamed because of the location that they were in. So uh, Caleb and Tammy and Sarah and Karen was there, of course. They made the presentation. And the presentation went well with lots of comments and questions from members of the, uh, of the Board of Education. And, there were questions that they did a couple of activities as well, as well as we've already shared the slide a presentation for you all as well. The Vibrant Learners, that group met uh, in July right after we did. And one of the uh, things that they met on was uh, they talked about what the future looks like in terms of the work that they're going to be doing. And so one of the tasks that they did as part of their committee meeting was to map out, uh, is to get into groups and look at what it looks like to map out a vibrant learner and what the definition of a vibrant learner might be. And then the evidence that supports what a vibrant learner is. And so they were working together and just, well, they were working and coming into a work stream groups. And in their work stream groups, they were going to address each one of these things, the definition of a vibrant learner, the evidence of a vibrant learner, and then mapping out what it might look like as part of their uh, big question, uh, the answer, what they were looking for in terms of their future work as part of uh, a committee. They also, uh, there was one question that came up that I thought was interesting that I thought I would share with all of you all. And that says they're going to be looking at what does uh, seeing a state balance and a local balance level look like when it comes to students that speak other languages. So those second language learners are English language learners. And if we're working to create a portrait, there was a question about making sure that we're inclusive of uh, of English language learners and how are we going to make sure that also local levels are inclusive because everybody has different levels of language learners within their communities. And I think those pretty much are the updates that I can remember in terms of where they're going. Everyone is working on their, um, on their, uh, I want to say BHAG, but we decided not to say that any longer, but they're working on what their questions with their, with the, um, uh, committee questions will be and how they're going to address those questions. And that's all that I have in terms of what we're what other committees are working on. I don't know if Andre or Susan has any other comments or thoughts about what they're working on. Well, we're, we're lucky to be joined by Sarah Snipes today, who's one of the facilitators of the Vibrant Learning Experiences Committee. Wondering, Sarah, if uh, there's anything else from your committee that uh, you'd like to add to what Kathy had to say. No, thank you, Kathy, for um, 
staying up to date on the work. I think that captured everything from our meeting. Um, I will add that we've since learned from the board meeting that there is an interest um, from Chair Robinson to explore further this um, notion of defining, not only defining vibrant learning, but then how do we know when we've seen it? Um, and we know our board is particularly interested in what it is and what it is not. Um, and then blending into your all's work. How do we begin to assess that? And what does it look like to assess student learning uh, within a vibrant learning experience? So really excited for where the collaboration is bound to take us in that. Sarah, could I maybe ask you, since you're on the call, uh, you also oversee all of the innovation initiatives and you always send out that wonderful newsletter on Friday. Uh, is there anything that you might want to highlight from that perspective? I know that's not technically like, you know, committee work per se, but it's related to the work of the committee. Do you think there's anything worthwhile sharing with our members across those initiatives? Um, probably top of mind right now, Andre, would be KDE's newest guidance that was just released um, today, actually, in the Commissioner's Monday hmm. message. That's meant to walk a community through portrait development all the way through thinking oh. and considering um, implications around a local assessment system. So I'll be happy to drop that link in the chat um, for you. That continues to build out our portrait of a learner webpage, um, and we hope that you find it really helpful. Um, we also are, uh, just a, a shameless plug, we are releasing, as of today as well, our Kentucky Innovative Teacher Fellowship applications. So this has really been a place over the last um, year in our first pilot where we convened 10 teachers from districts all across the state um, to really be in a fellowship together to create vibrant learning experiences and then give them a platform at the state level to really showcase and inform. Um, and we link them specifically to the work in United We Learn's uh, three big ideas. So um, those teachers have a wealth of knowledge and their lived experience in the classroom and what they're doing. And we um, found really close connections to bringing them in uh, as real models for the United We Learn Council to learn from as well. So if that's something, if you've got kind of names bouncing around in your head or you have schools and districts that um, would really be great to, to spotlight and participate in that, we'll be taking 10 educators through that work as well. And then, um, gosh, Andre, we're doing a lot. <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's actually good. great. <laughs> Keep going for a few minutes. I think we have the time. Like, I'll, I'll give you my five minutes for my block later. This is really valuable. <laughs> if anyone can, uh, you know, wants to give me a raise, I don't know. We're doing a little, a few <laughs> things. Um, then our uh, our math badging pilot is relaunching for the school year. It's a very small but mighty pilot. Um, we have five districts exploring um, what it could mean to credential student learning differently, specifically at the Algebra One level, just um, through experimentation. Um, and what does it mean to take um, standards and units and create more of a badging approach so that students aren't uh, necessarily penalized at the end of a course um, as a yes or no, you passed or failed, but instead look at what um, students do master to earn stackable badges that add up to a full Algebra One credential for upon course completion. Um, so that is taking from the assessment realm. We're really interested to learn from that pilot because um, our external partners with XQ Institute um, Measurement Inc. and Student Achievement Partners are working together on a more traditional concepts and skills assessment that looks more like what we're used to seeing um, when we think of assessment, probably in a testing situation. Um, but that's coupled with a portfolio of student evidence and performance assessments uh, and tasks. And so thinking about um, ways, all the ways that students can demonstrate um, mastery of skills and concepts uh, within the mathematics classroom and using that as the anchors of assessment to earn badges along the way to an Algebra One credential. So we're really excited about that. We are just starting implementation this fall, but really um, looking forward to supporting those Algebra One teachers. 
All right. Thank you, Sarah. That was a great update. Um, and I will plug Kathy and I were both at the June exhibition um, for the ILN uh, earlier this year. And I was just blown away with talking to the teachers and some of the amazing work that was going on across the state that was very innovative, um, both in assessment type work and vibrant learning. So a good mix of, of both going across the state. And I've definitely got some teachers in mind that I will be sending that application to. Um, so moving along, that takes us right into our Portrait of a Learner subcommittee update from Susan Lyon. So where are we at with this, Susan? Sure. So uh, I want to thank uh, the subcommittee for their participation. If you haven't been staying up to date, um, we've had a subset of us who um, engaged with, in the same activities that the Bold New Futures Committee was engaging with in order to seek out feedback and input, um, gather perspectives from the field around portrait of a learner, specifically thinking in context of the, using the portrait of a learner graduate um, as part competency determinations as part of a future possible graduation requirement. The Bold New Futures Committee then worked to put together a PowerPoint presentation that collated all the responses to the survey and pulled out major themes. And our subcommittee members, um, some of you attended the Bold New Futures meeting to offer your feedback and insight onto how they've done that and the key messages that you wanted to make sure were shared with the board. And then as Kathy mentioned in her update, um, the leadership from the Bold New Futures Committee shared that PowerPoint presentation that con contained your feedback as well as others um, related to that uh, potential graduation requirement. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that really meaningful collaboration. I We hope to sort of create additional opportunities for sort of um, infiltrating one another's committees in this kind of way. Uh, as I was going back to the grant, the federal grant requirement that funds some of this work, one of the things that we had stated that this committee would do in year one was to collaborate with this with the policy committee in exactly this kind of way. So we're on the right track. When I was looking at what our milestones are for going to be for the second year, it will be collaborating with the vibrant learning experience committee to be thinking through what is the design for the system bank that Andre is going to be talking about later today. So we're on track. Thank you very much for all of you that engaged in that experience and let us know as always what feedback you have to help make this more meaningful um, and uh, productive for all of you. So I think that is the update on that unless there's any questions regarding that work. Okay, so then I'll just move on to the next agenda item, which is sharing out our prototypes. So to catch those of you up to speed who might have um, been taking time off in July, as I hope some, all of you had an opportunity to do at least a little bit, uh, what we've been doing is talking about prototypes around system design. Ultimately, our task is to think about what might a new assessment and accountability system look like for the state of Kentucky that takes into account um, our three big ideas from the Kentucky United We Learn report and also our own good thinking, as was evidenced in the report from our, six, uh, our first six months together on those design principles. So to help us get us closer to that proposal, we're thinking about this as a system of systems. So what does that actually mean? It means that there is a state system, that would be the state assessment and accountability system, but of systems means, and it acknowledges values and lifts up, the local work that is happening in districts, each district having its own systems in place. And our job and task is to, is to sort of think about how can the state system be mutually supportive of and reciprocal to those local systems in a way that values and supports the vibrant learning experiences that we are hoping to see spread across the state. And so in order to tackle this problem, We've divided up into three work streams for the months of July, of June and July. 
to come up with system prototypes looking at a system of systems design from a different angle. So what would a fully centralized system look like, fully state centralized, or what are the components that we might want to make, make sure are in place from the state's role in that ultimate system of systems. So in thinking about a fully state centralized model, we're sort of thinking through what components are necessary to be controlled or managed or started at least at the state level. Similarly, then we had a working group working on state supported models, thinking about what is the role in supporting local districts in this good work and what are the key features that should be in place to help enable um, the state at being effective at supporting local districts. And then the third working group was thinking about those locally controlled elements of a system of systems, right? So what would a fully locally controlled model look like? Or what are the components that should sit and rest with the locals in this ultimate system of systems design? So what we'll be doing is going group by group to share out so we're all on the same page about the work and the conversations that happened. Uh, we sort of envisioned us having each group having an elevator pitch or here's the big key ideas that we discussed as a group, but I recognize we not might not all be as organized as coming up with a coherent elevator pitch, but at least please share out what your group discussed, where your thinking is at, what seems the most relevant to bring to this group. And the rest of us will be listening. We'll be thinking about where does what this, the other groups are talking about resonate with what we did and discussed in our group. Where might we find areas where we're complementing or mutually supportive of one another? Or where are those areas of real disconnect where actually, no, we're talking about different things and we better think about this and right, lift that up and, and bring it to conversation. So, I will begin by calling on the state centralized group for, oh, sorry, I'll begin actually by dropping a copy of our prototype document that we've been working on in the chat. So it's in the chat. You this is in our August meeting folder. If you're following along in the drive, you should all have access to it. Um, and so this is where we took notes <laughs> on our systems. So if I could call on the state centralized group to share out first, do we have any brave volunteers to maybe give a synopsis of what we've talked about. I know not everybody without every meeting, that's okay. Jerry, Kathy, Eddie, I think you all were at the la the latest of the meeting that we heard that we that we had. Hi, Susan. I will, uh, I'll do my best to share and, and get and provide the updates. And Betty did drop a note. Betty, I'm also getting over COVID, uh, but I'll do my best to share without coughing through most of it. Okay, so for the state centralized, let's see. I wasn't planning on sharing, so I will give do my best. Hold on. Um, that's all right, Kathy. Don't feel pressure. <laughs> if there's somebody else in our group that wants to jump in, or I can give a synopsis as well. Oh, Jerry, you came off mute. Go for it, Jerry. I'm actually driving right now and I'm afraid to multitask. All right, well, why don't I take a stab at it? You guys can fill me in where I got it wrong. So in our state centralized group, we were really thinking about lifting up two major priorities and designing a system around those priorities. So our number one focus was thinking about early literacy and recognizing that those foundational skills around uh, numeracy and um, reading literacy must be in place in order for us to create um, or for students to fully experience those vibrant learning experiences that we're envisioning. 
And so the R system places an emphasis on ensuring all readers have the um, literacy supports that they need in place to be reading by the end of grade two. And so we really focused on what are those state components that can help support that and ensure that that's happening. Our second focus was on making sure that we're being supportive of and coherent with the local assessment of portraits of a learner at the local level. So understanding that districts are developing their own portraits of learners or adopting the statewide portrait of a learner and working to create vibrant learning experiences aligned with that, we wanted to create a state centralized system that was supportive of those in ways that the current state assessment system may not be. And so we talked about including performance assessments within the state assessment system at key levels and not just a performance task within the standardized assessment framework, but really thinking about how can we innovate in the format of our um, assessment system so that students are asked to demonstrate their learning in some way that is outside of the box or similar to what they'd be doing in their defenses of learning ultimately when it came time to graduation. So we hadn't exactly landed on the, the grade levels in which these performance assessments would occur, but we were thinking at meaningful milestones throughout the K-12 career. Betty, I know you were in that group. Anything to add that I might have missed? Eddie? No, I think, I think you got it. All right, great. And then I'll turn it over well, to Susan, you. Susan, there was, ahead, I, you may have missed it in terms of supporting the literacy, the early literacy, and we were looking at by third grade um, that the literacy assessments are defined and that they are, um, that we're, that each community is well aware of what those assessments are and are, are delivering those assessments at the time that they're supposed to be. Uh, of course, within the state guidelines, as well as uh, within the milestones that there are milestones that are set, not just at the end, but through, but throughout, not just in third grade, but starting with kindergarten all the way through that milestones will be set. I'm sorry, I had to find my notes. I couldn't figure out what my no, notes No, that's were. a good important point around the structure of the assessment system. So we were not envisioning state standardized assessments, as you might imagine in those early grades, but instead the state providing access to high quality reading assessments that districts could use, and the state also then providing guidelines in terms of the benchmarks with the ultimate goal of having, I believe, 95% of the students literate by the end of grade two that Kathy, that's based on some research that Kathy had done. Andre, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm using the hand thing to see how that works. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, in this context, I thought it might be worthwhile pointing out, since everyone has access to this already, that we did take um, these notes in the table and actually uh, cooked up an initial vignette description, which you can find in the uh, team folder as well. And it takes the same ideas and just walks through them in a more, a slightly more coherent narrative form with some considerations then at the state level, at the local level, and how you might think about configuration options. So, because I know it's a lot of verbally to process, so if you want to read that at sort of at your own leisure, you can find that in the system examples subfolder of this meeting folder. And that's also where we have a copy of that spreadsheet that Susan was just pulling up for everybody. Super help, helpful. Thank you, Andre. Are there any clarifying questions for the state centralized group? I had a question about the performance task. Did you all get into discussion about kind of how those would be administered? Because I know, especially with Betty's expertise with the previous um, CURA system, that that was a key feature in. Um, Kara, but was dropped, I want to say pretty quickly. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the financial implications of administering those types of exams. Were you all envisioning that that would be something that would be done locally or coming specifically from the state? 
Yeah. So we talked a lot about this. Great question, Sarah. And I, I don't know that we landed on a decision per se, but I will say two of the ideas that surfaced was it was really important to our group that the tasks actually be scored locally. Maybe they're not developed locally and they're provided by the state, but they're scored locally in that that is, you know, if we take a performance task and we send it back to the state and wait them three, four, 10 months for it to get back, then we sort of lost the opportunity there in terms of understanding the richness of the student work, engaging in conversations with students around feedback and as professional teams of educators around next steps. And so I think part of the conversation our group was thinking about that scoring. And then we were also thinking about audits on that scoring, right? So ensuring that we're having a consistency in standards across the state. So making sure that those local scores are then audited by a state system to ensure that, you know, everybody is scoring in a way that is faithful to the student work presented. Um, and I think we also did discuss, speaking of the financial component, potential state stipends for the teachers, educators, additional work that comes along with providing the scores for those assessments. So um, instead of contracting with a scoring vendor, as you might for a standardized assessment, um, thinking about how can we um, value the work of educators through st stipends for their time engaging in that work. Awesome. Other things that we discussed related to the administration of the performance tasks that you all can recall. Yeah. It almost makes me think a little bit about the, the three course tasks that were kind of a conversation around the new science standards. Mm -hmm. um, they were a thing and then pre-COVID and then they've not been a thing post-COVID or at least if they are in some districts they've not been talked about in any of the ones I've worked in but I know pre-COVID there was a lot of conversations around locally developing pre or through course tasks for science standards and then providing those opportunities for students so I kind of see that as a jumping off point for for some of this work wow. interesting thank you guys yeah and, and I would say um, I guess I'm not using the hand. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> methodologically, I can't find the, hand. the hand. It's in the uh, reactions uh, little uh, icon on the bottom. So for anybody else, anyway. So <laughs> my hand. Um, so for the um, uh, methodologically, sorry, methodologically. So for the performance task, this also brings up the statewide issue that there's different initiatives, right, that are, are led by different organizations and there's some local efforts where everybody is trying essentially to do their best in order to, you know, develop databases of student work, of like evaluation protocols and procedures, ways to compose the committees, implementing that so that's an authentic and rich experience and then making meaningful and thoughtful sense of the results for like guiding students, but also for evaluation purposes in certain moments. So I think, uh, you know, we, we should wrestle, or we will have to wrestle as a committee with that. And I don't know, Sarah, if you're still on the call, um, and if you don't mind if I quickly ask you and say, if, if you don't know or not, not you're thinking about that, that's fine. But do you have, from your perspective, any way of wrangling that tiger, so to speak, of all of these different methodological approaches that are floating around, these best practices frameworks? Andre, are you asking me or are you asking Sarah Snipes? There's two oh, Sarahs I'm sorry, on this call. I was asking Sarah Snipes. Yes. Okay, because I was, I was just like, no, sorry. I have yes. no way. Right now. <laughs> yeah. so, but Andre, would you repeat your question again? Because I'm not quite yeah, sure yeah. I understood exactly what so, you were so, asking. Yeah, so um, I was saying that with uh, various local uh, innovation efforts, some of them you know, locally uh, driven, some of them state-sponsored or supported, um, there is going to be a variety of like best practices and frameworks uh, and methodological design work that's going on. And I know that also from we know this from talking to some districts, right? Where districts will be like, yeah, we're working on developing a student work database and we're trying, we have these, you know, we put these um, committees together by going out into the community and we have um, like sort of these quote unquote, semi-standardized evaluation and feedback practices, like we building best practices locally and, and everybody's doing this. So I thought from a state perspective, it might be really nice to sort of get a way of like comparing them across both the big 
you know, vendors and organizations, but also, you know, at least, you know, the people who have more robust systems in place. So I was wondering whether Sarah Snipes, since, you know, Sarah, you oversee a lot of these innovation initiatives, and I'm sure this comes up all the time, whether, you know, there's something in the cooker for like doing that or whether that's maybe not an issue that's very relevant. Um, I think they live right now relatively siloed into the various initiatives with it, which they're created. However, hmm. um, we're just now beginning to explore um, a, a tool that KDE actually has, which is a best practices database. Um, now, this is specific to some characteristics lifted up with Cognia. Um, and mm -hmm. is out uh, based out of the Office of Continuous Improvement and Support. But if you were to search for best practices on the link that I just dropped in the chat, um, you could see the start of a lot of some of the examples mm -hmm. that you just lifted up, Andre, like standards based report cards, for example, or yeah. very district specific um, pilots and programs with which have been developed locally. So this is I think the closest thing that currently exists for us. Um, and we're mm -hmm. excited to work with uh, Natasha Stein at the department this week, actually, to learn a little bit more about the behind the scenes. Yeah, perfect. This connects to my section later on. I, I, I wanted you to talk about this if you, if you had time and there was something that you felt worthwhile sharing. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's wonderful. Um, so that's your place for Co uh, collecting that and, and collating that at the moment. So that's great. Thank you. I'll come back to that later when um, we'll do the database uh, brainstorming phase. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to turn it over now to the state supported group. We can come back for more conversation on the state centralized later if needed, but I want to make sure we've got time to share the other. So uh, Jennifer, I believe that was your group. I don't know if you plan to have somebody present out. We do. We have um, a couple people plan to share out who are not here. <laughs> <laughs> so we had uh, we've had a couple really good uh, sessions um, along the way over the past couple of months. Uh, not everybody could join every meeting, um, but w those who did participate and were able to come, we had really uh, good discussions. Um, there, there are real two real priorities when we're, we're talking about the state supported. Um, the first of which is continuous improvement. And that is first and foremost uh, for the group uh, in terms of providing educators with um, information, actionable data that they can use for curricular decisions. Um, that was the kind of the big uh, priority um, there. And then the, the second priority was really giving uh, students um, the opportunities to make some decisions on their own, uh, that um, they uh, are given um, opportunities through a menu of um, types of assessments that they could utilize to demonstrate their knowledge skills and um, use those uh, for their their future in the whatever endeavors that they want to to go in. So those were kind of the two big priorities that um, for those that were able to uh, attend. Um, now we we looked at because it's state supported, um, they were looking at uh, like a combination. And I was really uh, glad to hear the state centralized uh, in the approach that that work stream came to um, through um, performance-based assessments, because I think that's where the um, state supported landed as well with a combination of uh, assessments as well as performance-based. I think the difference is was that um, the the performance assessments would be supported by the state, but completed locally, where that it would be um, uh, at the local district, uh, possibly provided by the state. Uh, didn't get into those uh, details, but um, like the fact that there were um, differences in performance 
and um, providing um, those areas for students to demonstrate um, their knowledge, skills, dispositions in the different types of learning outcomes, not just the standardized tests. Um, that would come through other means, um, possibly that uh, menu option, uh, but those uh, performance assessments would uh, then be able to be utilized by um, the students um, to monitor their own progress, uh, by teachers, parents, educators, to be able to uh, make those um, important curricular and individual student um, decisions. I looked um, closely at um, implementation. Um, as we mentioned before, diverse learners are centralized um, and an important aspect to um, not only where the Board of Education wants to be, but where uh, members of our committee want to focus. And so we really talked um, at, at length about how that students, transient students, could um, go from district to district and how that um, logistically that would happen uh, to be able to go from one district that has um, one type of um, system into another district with a different type of system. So this idea of a system of systems and how that would impact the students, we really dug into that um, quite a bit in our discussions. And, and I don't know if um, anyone is on the, from the other, from our group. Uh, let me see if anybody has um, logged in since. Um, I don't see. I don't see anyone from our group, but that's kind of where where the the discussions were. Oh, Cheryl, I, Cheryl, hi, hi. Um, yes, I'm, I had a death during that time, so that's why I could not join you all for that. Um, so I'm just excited. I'm I'm trying to catch up and um, recenter myself. So excuse me for not being able to contribute to that, but I am excited about um, the work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, does, does your group have any, this, the, what you just explained documented anywhere? What you just explained was so rich. I want to make sure we don't lose it. We do. Actually, we have been working in a, um, a document that's um, outside of the, the group because not everybody was able to be there. We didn't want to put it into the main document because not all of our group had time to weigh in or the possibility to weigh in. So yes, we do have that um, that template that of the vignettes. We do have a version of that that's outside of that main one. So we'll when once we get it um, more uh, eyes on it, we'll put it in there. Okay, great. I just want to make sure we weren't losing that anymore. Okay, no, great. Thank no, you. Yeah. Excellent. Are there any questions for the state supported group? Hearing none, and in the interest of time, we'll keep moving, but we can, as I said, come back. We'll we'll turn it over to the locally controlled group now to share what their thinking was in relation to this activity. So I can talk a little bit about that. And locally controlled is kind of wildly different from the other two that we've mentioned is that it is truly local and it is up to the, the local um, district to make decisions about what they value in their graduates and in their students. And that's really the kind of question that all the different districts that we had looked at that were locally controlled, that, that question is really what it comes down to is what does the local community value in students? What do they see as being necessary in order to be successful as an adult? And then developing a, an assessment system around that. Um, all of the, the ones that we looked at, I would say, have some form of a portrait of a learner. I think it would be very difficult to do this type of assessment and accountability system without having some kind of guiding characteristics. Um, we looked at some of the locally controlled ones here, 
in Kentucky, including Fleming County, which um, Laura Lynn and uh, Erica and I took a look at, and their uh, bridge performance indicators, which really goes greatly in depth about how they are outlining what the expectations are for students in every grade level, K through 12, what the student has to do in order to successfully promote to the next grade, and then holding the student and the, the parents to some extent accountable for doing that um, with multiple attempts if it's necessary in order to demonstrate mastery in order to move on to the next grade. And so you're thinking about kind of an, an elevator pitch type of moment. It's really about students finding their own meaning about what they value in their education as well and developing that individualized, personalized education system for those students. It requires a lot of artifact keeping. I think that's one big challenge that all of these systems have done. Um, in fact, I know, uh, Laura Lynn can probably talk some about the Canyon City um, one in Colorado that we looked at where when they went in and they had revised um, their system after doing it for so many years because they realized it wasn't working for their students. Um, I've been in chats with uh, Brian Fleming, who's the superintendent from, or excuse me, Brian Creesman, who's the superintendent in Fleming County, who has talked about, has sent me their representation for uh, what he's calling version 3.0, for their local accountability system and the improvements that they've made where they're streamlining the work for their students to narrow the focus onto what, again, what is really important? What does the community define as important? And so you're gonna really have to start if we wanted to look at that type of system, we're really having to start with a series of community meetings because you've got to get input from all your stakeholders. It's not just something that's devised at the state level or at the, um, uh, with with assess, standardized assessments. And so Suzanne, Andre, I don't think Suzanne's on here today, but Laura Lynn, Eric, I saw both of you all. Anything else that you all want to chime in on that? Yeah. Anybody else first? Or otherwise I might say um, so in Canyon, sorry, this is Laura Lynn. Um, in Canyon City, um, really community was at the core from the very beginning and all the way through the process and it was this kind of continuous build um, all the way through they are part of helping the students determine what they're going to do how they're going to do it and then they're helping in the measurement process and the support all the way through the end so they are that partnership all the way through um, and the other thing was, as you mentioned, that um, that the process adjusted with time. Um, their big adjustment was they opted to go down from four years to two years in the high school, um, primarily because of supporting students of transient populations. Anybody else want to say? If not, I'll say something to give over to other people. Okay, so I'm just going to maybe reflect on something which is, uh, and Susan, this goes back, Susan Lines, in this case, this goes back to what you and I were talking about today. I think I'm, I'm going to bring this up, which is that really this idea that, um, you know, it's not an absolute question of whether a system, if you think about system as a comprehensive system of, you know, assessment tools and practices, accountability tools and practices, instructional practices and development and management and reporting practices and so on and so forth that that is exclusively state controlled or exclusively locally controlled. So it's probably best to think about that as a way of configuring or mixing the different components. If you're a musician, you are, uh, you know, uh, of this system in a way that meets the, the goals and the values of your local and then also from the state perspective of the state by theories of action um, of your system. So um, in case, you know, we, I, I find like if you ever get stuck mentally in that, that might be a nice way of sort of getting out of that corner of feeling like everything has to fit in that one orientation. Um, and so when we are going to work on some vignettes in the next little while, um, we're sort of going to play with that as well, um, with this sort of representation and, and, and talking about these use cases. And I might even say one other thing since we have a few minutes. So one of the other things that came up is, so when people talk about their system examples, I think the, the point is that generally it's never really like perspective neutral in the sense that, 
you don't talk about it without having some kind of focal points, which typically are grounded in these local theories of actions, the goals that are being set. So if you say like, oh, we want to capture like a particular system without any kind of like framing or entry point, then it becomes this overwhelming, really huge beast because you have to consider everything, right? Everything from teacher development practices and hiring pipelines to local assessment accountability efforts to local instructional practices to health and safety and all of that. Um, but if you focus on something and say like, you know, in our district, we are currently foregrounding early literacy, for example, and that's by the way, what helped, I think, the state supported group. And also when we were writing that into a vignette description to sort of say up front, like we want to foreground this issue. And so from this issue, let's think through the entire system of the key practices, the key uh, tools, evaluation mechanisms, key supports. What is our system of continuous improvement? Then it becomes a manageable thing. So I also wanted to offer that up to people. So if you ever feel like you're getting stuck with this too much, I know I've had that in my past when I was trying to we're gonna get at this with the systems bank as well. That might be also helpful for thinking about this. Thanks, Andre. So we've got about 15 minutes for discussion now. And just to remind you, we're sort of thinking about how are our system prototypes that we described mutually supportive of one another or in conflict with one another? And I might offer up just a provocation, a question to help ground this discussion. Ignore it if you'd rather contribute to something else that rises to the top for you. But the question I would lead with is, from the locally controlled group, where does it make sense for the state to either mandate or support? Right. What would be helpful for the state to mandate or support? So would it be a process based thing where you must be engaging the community at this point, this point, this point? Or would it be here? We're going to provide these um, a measurement tools that help you assess the statewide competencies, thinking broadly from your local system, where might the state play a role that could be supportive. Or others, it doesn't have to just be the local group that responds to that. <clears throat> Susan, could I ask a question real quick? Please. For the for the locally controlled group, did did you did your did your group have any discussion about the consistency of expectations from district to district? We did not really get into that discussion, Jerry, and I think that's a, a good point. I don't think we got that far, honestly, um, but I think that's a good point, particularly with the discussions that we're hearing today about how we can support those students that are transient um, across district lines. And yeah. I, th I think that's kind of where, when we're looking at building the systems bank, that I think is a flaw in the locally controlled because it's not portable. It's not portable like a state supported or a state centralized one would be um, to some extent because it is strictly around what the local community wants to do, particularly around that, that portrait. Um, now, I think the fact that the ones that we looked at were designed, you know, their tasks are designed around state standards as far as standards for reading, standards for math, social study science, that kind of thing, that that you're pulling in some consistent piece there, but how the student is demonstrating mastery is, is more left up to the local district. Yeah, I mean, I think about, and the one I'm most familiar with is Fleming County, which you all examined, and I think about their measures of quality, they build on each other from one year to the next. And, and you know, I think about a student who might move into that district who has been a part of another local accountability system. Let's say they move in as a junior or a senior. And I, I just wonder how the connection can be made from, from two very different local accountability systems, which, which leads me into Susan's question and, you know, I think some, you know, how does the state support a local accountability 
system like that. I, th I think it ha having those um, those required measurements along the way, though, you know, measurement for literacy by third grade, those types of things could be something that the state could offer that would really help with building a good local accountability system. I kind of would like to add too, we're, we've been doing a lot of work as I know every district is with the Senate Bill 9 and there are assessment requirements within that for literacy that we're all, we're all kind of working with. So the assessments that are diagnostics, they've been defined um, and they have a bank of assessments that can be utilized. So I can see some consistency happening with our K through three realm, just in the early literacy and those pieces. But then when we get to even our intermediate grades at our district, we have high quality curricula that we utilize. So we have a lot of curriculum based measures that are used for performance tasks or writing. And that's how we gauge, gauge the assessments mm -hmm. for the standards within our own community. Um, so I do. I, I see there could be some benefit to having a bank of, of assessments that are our choices, but I also know that sometimes those assessments that I'm looking at, we have better ones <laughs> that we're using for diagnostics. So that I kind of, I'm on, on the devil side of that sword. I appreciate that we have some defined assessment components, but what I'm using currently feels more in line with what we're doing districtly. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. what are some thoughts. That that makes sense to me. And I will say that one of the, the strong points about Fleming County system in particular is they are heavily focused on writing and writing being kind of a cornerstone of their, their system for and, and expecting, and the measurement that they're using for writing is the state writing um, rubric, the one that the on-demand writing is scored with on the current uh, KSA test. I still wanna call it K-PREP. Um, but um, I think that, you know, Andre is bringing up a point here about, about supporting the students, that I think if we're going to look at doing more local control, then the locally controlled systems really have to have those measures in place for like specific plans for what are you gonna do with your students that transfer in junior year and they haven't done any of this pre-work and they've never been asked to think this way before or demonstrate these characteristics and they don't have anything in their portfolio and you're gonna tell them they can't graduate high school if they don't have this um, and kind of come up with different scenarios to support those students, whatever the case may be. I and I feel like- up a I'm sorry, Sarah, I didn't mean to- Go ahead. You. Okay. I think okay. I think you bring up a good point because I think that's the issue that we keep going back to is the current assessment system. We can't do anything with that data in the in real time. Mm -hmm. So having these other measures that actually can guide instruction and move students forward is really the key. And I don't know how um, it can be defined by one entity and brought down. So I guess that's, I'm still kind of on the fence about that because in Davis County, we have we have a high population of uh, immigrant students and migrant students, and we're just trying to get their heads above water. And I feel like I just don't want to bang them down even any harder than mm -hmm. they already feel. So I'm, I know I'm kind of stepping outside, so I, I appreciate y'all letting me have that minute, just kind of process a little bit. Well, you know, I think, I think if, Again, I'm going back to Susan's question. What? How can the state support a local accountability system? And I think part of the answer to this is that the state, the state provides the minimum requirements in terms of student achievement, not necessarily telling them exactly what to use, but these are the things that must be measured. And you know, I'll go back to that literacy piece again. You know that that that's that's a non-negotiable that has to be measured at the end of third grade and there are other things I think like that that can be measured if you look at these different local accountability systems they're they're measuring all kinds of things that that are related to students but it's not necessarily directly student achievement it's some of the ancillary things like 
you know, transportation and food service and things like that that impact a student's um, experience at school. But I think if the state can provide some guidance in terms of what are the minimum requirements, it gives the local districts the flexibility then to measure those things that are important to their communities. I think that's a valid point, Jerry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do too. And Jerry, you made me think about, we already do that to some extent. For example, the school district that I work for does not require Algebra 2 as a graduation requirement, but the school district that my own personal child attends does. And that actually surprised me because I was like, oh, he doesn't have to take algebra. Oh, guess he does. That's a requirement in this district to graduate because the state sets the minimum graduation requirements, but districts can always go above and beyond. So maybe that's what we're looking at here. What is the minimum requirement for a student in Kentucky, whether that's pulling in that literacy component that you were talking about with third grade, um, pulling in, you know, certain, because we already have that to some extent with the graduation requirements. Um, for what constitutes a, a diploma in Kentucky, but local districts do go above and beyond that um, as it is. And, and certainly now with Fleming County, you can't get a diploma from their school district. You can get your GED, but you can't get a diploma from their school district without demonstrating mastery on what they're using as a local accountability system. Sarah, it's such a useful connection that you're drawing there. If we think about graduation, uh, it's one of those things that's clearly not comparable across districts. Right? You just provided a great example of Algebra 2 versus not Algebra 2. Yet, the federal government treats it as comparable. The graduation rates reported at the school level mm -hmm. are just are we value that as comparable. We value the local processes that are in place to determine whether or not a student has um, met the minimum requirements for graduation. That's a local process. Yes, Jerry, the state, as you really actually point out, sets the minimum requirements as it should. Districts then have their own local processes for adopting local policies. And then they make local determinations about whether each individual student meets those requirements. And then the federal government calls it comparable when it's, when it's on its face not. So it's kind of an interesting um, point <laughs> to consider as we think about what is and is not acceptable as evidence within a federally approved accountability system. So just wanted to, to note that. Andre, we've got a couple of minutes left. I know you've been dying to jump in, so jump in. Um, okay, so let me say quickly then two things. I think one of the um, one of the notes of appreciation I have for the commentary that you made was in some sense, it sounds obvious, perhaps, but this idea of saying, um, how do we ensure consistency for certain situations, right, across the state? It's already important to name all of those kinds of features that we want to have from a statewide perspective for our future system. Because if there can be agreement on the fact that we need consistency and then start to defining that and illustrate that, then you know there's various ways in which you can achieve consistency, right? But you, you could like you have consistency, for example, across everyone, well, to some degree, but reasonably across every district that buy, let's say buys into the PBL works model, for example, right? Because they have standardized procedures for doing this. And if you buy into their gold standard and their practices, you get consistency across those districts, um, as an example. And there's other ways of getting consistency, which is by externally dropping, you know, assessments or procedures into districts. There's other ways of like getting um, consistency by leveling up, giving people a lot of choice, but then doing professional development and building trust into the system that, you know, you get eventual like, you know, over time improvements and that those improvements in that culture around it is sufficient enough. So I think I really appreciate that we, we, we in our future thinking, we really need to sort of think about this goes back to the design principles about the features that we want that system to have and sort of say like, whatever we do, however we get this in the mix, let's make sure that we that we work toward consistency by which we mean these things. So that I want to mention that briefly. Super helpful, thank you. And so we'll, in the interest of time, we'll leave this discussion here. I'll just note what's gonna happen between now and our next meeting in September. 
So there's no homework, no tasks assigned for a this agenda item for our committee members. Thank you. We value the work that you did to get us to this point. Now our committee chairs and facilitation team will work to produce one or more vignettes, as Andre alluded to earlier, that will reflect back to you what we think we heard in terms of system design, moving us along the path a bit further towards a, an ultimate systems, system of systems. All right, thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Andre, for the next item. Amazing. Thanks so much, Susan. Yeah, so if, if you don't want to have homework from Susan, you just wait a little bit and I'll give you some homework. I have about one hour of homework for everybody um, after this, um, but you have, a, you have a little bit of time to do it. Um, so what we're going to do in this section is we're going to talk about a systems bank. And not really talk about, actually, we're going to get you to ideate and uh, think through what that might look like. And I want to be clear to say that by doing that, we are not committed to any particular technological solution to any particular kind of use yet. Um, but it is something that we had called out in the CGSA grant. And it came out of this very simple idea of saying, like, you know, if you put yourself in the State Department shoes, they probably want to get some sort of um, information about what is going on across the different districts and what their best practices are and um, what that means, what the best assessment of practices are, accountability or quality improvement practices are. And for that, you do need to collect something, right? You do need to learn what's going on. And I know there's already, like Sarah uh, uh, Snipes has been talking earlier about the fact that there's various innovation initiatives and there's a lot of really good work going on. Um, but that's not necessarily the same as allowing other people um, insight and a view into that work, right? Which, especially at the State Department level, where you sort of can't say like, well, you know, maybe, well, maybe you could, but, you know, we'll visit every district all the time and just get sort of qualitative information. Unfortunately, the State Department also needs sort of some systematically collected information where you trade in some of the degree of nuance at some point in time. And so this is where this idea of like a systems bank, and sort of the simple idea of like a repository, a place where inform relevant information can live for different user purposes. And so what we wanna do today is I wanna quickly um, set up a task for you um, and uh, get you to brainstorm a little bit from different user perspectives about this. We're gonna get that started. My guess is probably that you'll get through like two of the five or six questions that we have for you. Uh, and then, you know, the rest, we just ask you to finish that after this meeting, but either you can do this either online independently, or if you wanna to get together, you can do that. Um, so let me pull up some information for you here. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. So there we are. Okay, so in the... Um, Sorry, go back. So in the August 7 virtual folder, there is this subfolder called System Bank Brainstorm. So earlier we looked at the system example. So this is the Systems Bank Brainstorm. Um, and in this, you can see there's like five copies uh, of the sheet that I'm going to pull up in a second. I don't think we need all five, actually. We're probably going to put you in like um, three or four groups max, maybe even just two. Um, and so here's what that sheet has. It has... At the top, some information I'm going to go through in a minute. It has some examples. Yeah, people are clicking on it. I love it. And then um, a task description, um, then the questions that we're going to work on, and then some uh, information that's probably best processed after, unless you're a quick scanner, um, where we gave you some ideas from um, some you know experiences and examples that we've had, and just to give you a starting point. Okay, so the idea is this. What might a system, a bank of a system of systems look like? Um, there are some banks in the world out there, and you may have heard of the Canopy project. Uh, I know the Vibrant Learning Experience project has been exploring that. So I'm going to pull this up because we thought it's probably easier to give you an example uh, rather than talking about this in the abstract. So here, for example, you have an example of um, a database, essentially where you can search it in different ways. And that's what that interface looks like. And then if you uh, go on further, you see sort of that they've made some decisions about this is the information that we're going to put here. This is the kind of interactivity features that we want to give people when they can um, uh, interact with this. So for example, um, you know, you can um, 
click, oops, now I clicked on here. Well, you can click on these. I guess I just did that. You can click on these and they open up new pages or you can hover over them and they give you additional information about some components here. There's like, you know, weights imported. There's like considerations about how long has a practice been in place and so on and so forth. Um, and then you can go a little bit more, uh, one level deeper into detail. So there's these different looks at what's going on in district. And it's, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, text that is being provided by someone where they sort of update and say, like, this is where we currently are. These are our innovation efforts and so on and so forth. So that's one example of what a bank could look like. And, that, and behind the bank, maybe I'll, I'll share this with you because I have it here in the document anyway. Um, it's probably good to think about, like, what's the labeling it's, or for those of you uh, who've heard the word tagging, what the tagging architecture is behind the scenes. So these are, for example, um, all the different terms that the Canopy project uses in order to describe the different local systems. And why that's something like that is helpful, which we would have to think about as well in the future, is because it essentially is your way of saying this is the stuff that matters. So that exists as well. Two other examples, and then we'll go into the task and you have time to talk to one another. So one another example is not about a district system, um, but it's about a performance assessment task. And this looks slightly different, um, but similar kind of idea. So you have an interface here where you can search for different kinds of tasks by subject, by grade level. And then you have sort of short index cards in this case. They look here, look like this, and you can learn more about these than by, oops, yeah, now I have to sign it by um, clicking on these and then you get more detailed descriptions. Now, we found out the other day, which was actually good news, that KDE also has this little portal that Sarah Snipes was talking about earlier. So there is this best practices portal. And why that's relevant is because depending on what the department you know, decides and has resources for in terms of internal development, there is this decision right, that needs to be made about if we do this, do we try to dock onto an existing system that is owned by somebody else, or would we do this internally? And so if you wanted to do this internally, there's a database architecture that's behind the scenes here um, where you can, um, that already allows you to search for some best practices. So I can click on search advanced option. You see the same kind of idea that there's certain categories by which you can search for something. So for example, if I did, let's see whether Fleming has anything in here, I tried, um, I'm sure they do, but you never know. You think so? No. Okay, so Fleming does not have, even though they have good practices, so they don't have anything in here yet. And then uh, it's, don't, so just, don't search by district. If you just click search without selecting anything, just hit that magnifying glass, it'll show you all. And uh, there you go, or all will work. That is true, but I do know that Shelby has oh, some stuff. In there, so I was gonna, I was just curious myself now because I hadn't shown. So there are there are certain pieces of information there, and then you can go deeper into this and click on that. And um, so, Sarah, you said earlier, since we're looking at this, I don't know whether you're still on the call, um, but you said earlier that I know you're meeting with your database manager and the virtual learning experiences committee is, is sort of thinking also about, like, how do we capture relevant best practices from the districts, right? Is there anything else you want to share today about that or, that, or is that essentially it? She's still there. She's still there, or did she leave the room? I know she had to potentially go, and then, yeah, okay. So she had to leave. And so that that's. Let me just say this. That's then all I know about the development process. I just we found this out relatively recently, like two weeks ago, and um, other people were kind of surprised too that there's this and supposedly a few other databases that exist that the department has that we can build on. And for for our committee, I think this will be a really good opportunity space and the mindset is that we don't do this by ourselves. So number one by ourselves meaning conceptually, even if we though we start engaging about this today, then we'll have to be cross fertilized with at least the virtual divide and learning experiences before we have something that is more of a proposal for work moving forward. Uh, and secondly, you know, we you have to think about updating of information, maintaining of the system, ownership and all of that. So um, this idea that there is sort of an internal architecture that we could possibly build on, you know, is, is something worth knowing about. So those were the 
examples that are on the top here so you can access them at any a given point in time and you may even have you know a database or a system that you've seen in your career where you go like yeah man this is really wonderful uh, i want to share this and so in that case you know please do as you're sort of working through this task we always love to uh it's always good to see new new examples because we pick these just to keep the number short and small uh number small uh, so that it's not too overwhelming but there's of course you know other systems that may have either a nice interface or like uh, embedded in a culture also and in programs that make uh, the sharing of information really valuable. So what do we want you to do? So we're going to have two groups, meaning two types of groups, where we want to have one type of group think about the users. And I, we want you to just start ideating and thinking through what a user with a particular set of responsibilities and perspectives and experiences might need from a bank like this. Like what's the kind of information that should be captured? How might they be using this in the first place? Because the reality, as you all know, is if you can't even come up with particular valuable uses and descriptions of user profiles, it's really not worth doing any hardcore development work because you just don't, you know, like unless somehow you put a bet in there and you say like people will get a great insight uh, uh, while they're doing the development. Um, so at least like a minimum sufficiently, uh, a minimum sufficient, a minimally sufficient like user profile and uh, user experience. That's what we're looking for. And there's some questions, right, that come along with this. So who might be using this bank for what purposes and in what settings? Um, then the next question becomes, so what kind of information should therefore go into the bank? Um, there's things to think about in the long term about like, what kind of features should the bank have to make it maximally useful? You saw some things like, you know, I can search for this, I can add tags, you know, um, it, you know, how often, you know, uh, do the data need to be refreshed and so on and so forth, and which is the next point. So how might the information be added to the bank and maintained over time. That's actually a real issue. So we've all done, you know, some surveys and some interviews with different districts. You work in a district maybe, and you know, sort of like there's things that change like maybe once a year or maybe every every few years. And then there's information that changes like all maybe on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, sometimes even daily. So, you know, it, is that, and if you start putting information into a bank and it changes frequently, it's quickly out of date, right? So there's like that kind of challenge. Um, who should be involved in the design uh, and tryout of these? So like once you start mocking up something, you know, we can low tech mock up on paper or PowerPoint. You can do more mid tech mock ups or you can do some like really matured mock ups, like fiddle with a live website or something like that. And who should be looking at that? Uh, and is there anything else that you want to share? So what we hope that you can do today is that you can start tackling this and in particular the first two questions i think these are probably the most easiest to get started which is like who might be using this kind of a bank for what purposes and in what settings and what kind of information might be therefore put into the bank and you can use higher level categories rather than all the nitty-gritty there is some information here at the end where sort of like you just see on the left hand side there's these bold face labels so you know, basic profile information. You saw that in the Canopy Bank about like how many students of what ethnicities uh, and backgrounds, uh, you know, something about theory of action or their goals. Should that be in their assessment uh, information about the assessment ecosystem, the accountability ecosystem, um, pedagogical efforts or initiatives or design, or anything about post secondary transition work in particular? Teacher professionalization could be a part of that, conditions of schooling, or you maybe you have other um other uh ideas so that's what we love you to do and i and susan how many groups do we have at the moment uh my understanding was that you wanted two groups one tackling this from a potential state perspective and the other thinking about it from the district perspective has your thinking shifted um, only in, possibly in terms of the number of people, because we were all earlier for everyone earlier, we were looking at how many people we actually have from our committee. And so if the number is really small, then I think two groups and putting other people from outside into that is fine. So I think if we do that, we have essentially eight plus eight. And then Susan, you and I, we can sort of float amongst the two. Um, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll, or it's like four and four and four and four. 
um, could we, so I, I have to say, I think four would actually be my preference, four groups, if we could do that. Is that okay? Susan, just set that up. Yes, no problem. Just give me a quick second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Figure this out. So um, in the meantime, what I'll then take your time, what I'll say is, so we have four groups. We'll have group one, two, three, four labeled, like no fancy names. Uh, Susan is going to be um, hopping between groups one and two for a little bit. I'm going to be hopping between groups three and four. And um, in the folder, in this one here for the Systems Bank brainstorm, there is four copies of that sheet, the five really, but we only need four, four copies of the sheet that I just showed to you. So um, we would like you then to pull up the one uh, for your group. You should be four people in the group. Maybe there's an external person, one more or so, uh, and then start thinking about it, talking about it, and take some notes about the user profiles. In groups one and two, um, we like you to think about a district user. So someone who is either a school leader, probably, or a teacher, um, could even be potentially a community member, but let's, I would say let's start with district or school leader or a teacher, former teachers often anyway, the district leaders. And then the other two groups, three and four, we would love for you to think about a state department person. And we do this because, you know, one of the things that comes up in these conversations that we have in the committee a lot is actually just the simple tension between, you know, the state has different responsibilities than the school and the district, right? So they have different jobs, they need different kinds of information, and they need, there's different processes and different needs therefore baked into this. And so if we try to put everybody together and start to be undifferentiated, it's probably a little bit unhelpful, at least at the beginning. So um, and it might mean that the bank, you know, would have two different kind of requirements and systems and pieces, but that is okay. You can handle that with like logons or multiple versions or that. That's not it. That can all be technologically handled nowadays. So think about essentially just the usability of that from those two different perspectives. And I would ask you all to be sort of like willing to play in, in this little sandbox for the next half hour and then one, one hour probably after this with us. So there's a lot of good reasons why you might say, yeah, you know, why should we do this? Now it will cost money, it's hard to maintain. Yes, but today the goal is not to be pessimistic. Today the goal is to be saying like, in the best possible scenario, what might be some users and who might be doing that? Okay. I'll stop talking and uh, Susan, you can, um, if you would be so nice and push the people into the different groups uh, and then we can uh, take any questions in the groups. I just want to give, give everybody a chance to get started there. Sound good? Yeah, I'm, I'm moving our fantastic state support to group two for now, but let me know if you'd like to be somewhere else so you'll be all together. All right, thank you. Okay. Hey, Eddie has arrived. This is very good. <laughs> he was driving when we had him in a in a room and we was like, oh, oh. Like, well, you just disappeared. Like Eddie and I were like, where'd Andre go? He actually yeah, got pulled out of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I got pulled out. I wanted to say something to you and now I forgot what it was. But we'll I mean, you were mid-sentence and poof, you're gone. Yep. <laughs> How is I'm my like, poor skill, Zoom skills? Sorry about that. Sarah. I'm like, that's nah, fine. I'm like the reverse <laughs> Aladdin. I disappear. Um, okay, um, a few quick comments uh, on my end, and, and Susan, maybe uh, if, if you have anything that you want to share, that's like that too, in case there's anything that you observed. I wanted to say, um, so number one, yes, it's a lot, right? It's, and it's a very different mindset when you start thinking about this kind of, the problem sort of, of what information do we need? How do we maintain it from this way? But in the groups that I was in, um, I think number one, what I've really seen that I like that I think is really productive is to really focus on specific roles and situations. So rather than trying to um, boil the ocean, just start with something very concrete. So we had examples of um, someone at the State Department who is working with schools that are underperforming or classified as CSI, TSI, for example. And now if they had access to a bank that contained, for example, examples of innovative practices and supporting action research, and they could 
connect schools with one another maybe and, and share that and the schools would have direct access to that one use that was very different from the use of someone at the state department is working with two districts because they have a lot of transient students who migrate from one from one district to another and they want to make sure that the schools or the districts have the resources um to support students in those situations so um in this case the idea was like well then we need some information about performance expectations and we need some information about we need the transcripts ideally and things like that and in, eventually in practice you know the reality is you'd probably have an ecosystem of databases but in actually really powerful state departments like connecticut for example they have spent years to really integrate all of their data systems we had a session on that and then ncsa this summer where you can sort of like see the power of bringing everything together. And they're still working on that, but they have seen really big gains. So it's actually good to take this data governance, data uh, engineering, thinking about that in a unified way. So I want to encourage you all, um, summer one, we want you to, to work on this and at least take, you know, I would say shoot for maybe two or three use cases. So what, what I did in the form and I took notes is I sort of wrote down use case one on the top, then use case two, maybe there would be use case three. And then you, for each one of those, you could sort of add some information in the other, uh, for the other questions. So two or three use cases, two is a minimum, I would say, so that you contrast that a little bit and you get a sense of the differences and expectations and, and design specification that might arise out of that. Is it good to experience that? Um, and also to make sure, last thing I'm going to say is that, again, like if you were in groups three and four, your job is to think about the role of a State Department representative. Like if you're sitting at the State Department, you have certain responsibilities, even if that means you work typically with district leadership, maybe school leadership or with co-op leadership, that's fine. But how would you interact or have people then instruct other people to interact with the bank it's sort of a mix right and if you groups one and two the, it's the opposite question if you are in a district or school your teacher you had this bank existed what are some things that you might want to do in terms of like instructional planning assessment selection maybe learning about what's going on in other districts so that you can implement best practices getting you know could be different kinds of roles so that's that's sort of my guardrails for this and i'll send you another email we'll we'll ask you to complete this in a we would like you to complete this in you know i would say two-ish weeks would be really nice so we have something to act upon and again you could do this independently or you could maybe find maybe one hour meeting once to get together we'll leave that up to you um and if that's of course if that's you know somehow really, really, really doesn't work, then let us know, push back and say like, you know, look, if you can have another week, that would be great. Um, we'd rather have your work than not have you do it if it's about a few days extra that you need. But it would be good if we had, you know, in the next three weeks or so, some in this information completed so we can actually report that back with to you and work with you on something related, build on that at the next committee meeting. Susan, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Something that came up in your meeting, Susan Lyons, in this case. Uh, no, our our group did um, a great job diving in to the ambiguity and coming up what would be helpful from the district perspective. So I yeah. wasn't there for the end of the conversation, but I was there for the beginning and um, looking forward to reading through what happened after I left. All right, I think it's over to back to Sarah, unless Andre, you have. No, thank you everybody for, for being willing to play a little bit in this. And it's a, it's a you know, this is, is a longer process. This takes something that maybe that's, I should say this, this like if this gets designed, I mean, and this, you know, this was all our day job and we wanted to crank through this in a few weeks or months, we could probably do this, but it's more like a multi-year effort. In our grant, for example, we called this out as, being ready like after two years or so, maybe three even. Um, so may not have to take that long, but the point is it's about learning how to think about these different user profiles and experiences and then iterate through that. And there's all kinds of problems that need to be solved. But right now we just want to get you in that mindset, in that habit, uh, at least in certain moments. So we can also learn what your uh, needs are and then 
we can formalize that and, and do some mock-ups eventually on, and, and, and all of that, but it's a process. Thank you. All right, thank you, Andre. So we're coming down to kind of cross collaboration or cross committee collaboration and what you all want the other two committees to know about our work. So um, in interest of uh, one in time and two, because the last time I've asked this question in meetings, it's been crickets on this question. Um, I'm just gonna kind of sum up some of the notes that I took during this meeting today. And then if you all have anything else that you thought of that you feel like is really relevant to me adding in, let me know and I'll add those to the notes. So um, kind of coming out to what we discussed as far as our work on our six months goal, with our um, prototypes from state centralized, uh, looking at two possibilities with an early literacy focus and state provided performance tasks that will be administered and scored locally with auditing by the state. Sarah Snipes discussed best practices database with that, that was an existing possibility that we currently have going in Kentucky with Cognia support for work that is similar. The state supported group discussed how the first priority is continuous improvement by providing actionable data that can be used for curricular decisions that is, is more in real time and not lagging um, a year behind. And then giving those students opportunities to make some decisions on their own. Students are given choices through a menu of types of assessments that they could utilize to demonstrate their mastery in standards. And then state supported also discussed a combination of assessments, including performance based that performance assessments will be created and completed locally and students could monitor their own progress, allowing teachers and parents along with students to make those curricular decisions. And then we had discussion at that point kind of around how would we support those transient students that would be impacted by moving from a district that had one system versus another. And then that kind of led into that discussion with locally controlled, which is depending upon what the community values and graduates, what does it take to be successful, designing a local system that will measure those components in a highly personalized way, usually designed around a portrait of a learner or some other type of characteristics list. Does anybody have anything else that they want me to add in on those notes for when I talk to other committees? I think it might also be good to mention that we're working beginning conceptualizations of the systems bank design as well. I, I that was next on my list. Oh, sorry, Andre, Sarah. No, that's fine. <laughs> sorry. I just didn't want to. I was moving into the two big parts yeah. of our meeting so that Andre then led us in a systems bank discussion um, about canopy um, as, as a possibility and a prototype for and then breakout sessions and looking at it from different perspectives. And I'll add that in there as well. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, and uh, Sarah, I might say you might not want to make it sound like you know canopy was sort of like the selling point, but that canopy and some he showed some, maybe Andre showed some examples of different like existing databases, and then that mm -hmm. the people like um, brainstorm and ideate about some use cases like users and situations and features uh, of the systems bank. Just um, Otherwise, people might get turned off, you know, that, oh, they want us to use Canopy or something. Right, like right. So yeah. I added in there discussions about Canopy and other possible databases as a systems bank um, in breakout sessions and looking at the database usage from different perspectives and how it would be useful. Sarah, I would also mention the um, current bank that of best practices that KDE already has. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Jennifer, I think we should have an update on that probably for also like next meeting, so in a month from now. Um, I, th I think we'll get some more clarity on, from the VLE people and mm -hmm. from your office about like, you know, where does Kitty want to go with that anyway? And if not, like, can that, what can be leveraged, what cannot be leveraged, and all of that? That'd be good. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, the last item on our agenda is just some um, housekeeping stuff. One, um, our next meeting will actually be the second Monday since the first Monday is Labor Day. So we will, and you'll be getting a calendar invite to correct that because the current one is on Labor Day. We are not gonna meet on Labor Day. We'll meet on September the 11th, um, four to six Eastern time. 
And then the other one is that my tenure as chair is coming to an end at the end of this calendar year. And so Kathy, according to our charter, will be stepping up as chair and we will need to have elections for co-chair. So by the October meeting, we would like, if you are interested in that position, we would like you to be um, submitting a letter of why you're interested in that position and so forth. So we'll be discussing that some more at the September meeting for the processes behind that. So, um, but we have a lot of really um, very engaged people in this group that I think would do a great job. And please uh, consider uh, the possibility of um, stepping up and taking on some of this leadership role. I will admit our Friday morning group is fantabulous. Like we have a lot of fun on Friday mornings in our, our weekly meeting. And it's, it's not that much. Wow. Okay, anything else that I'm forgetting, Susan, Andre, Jennifer? Uh, one, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, one note that I would uh, just remind everyone that the recruitment and feedback survey for the Kentucky United We Learn Council members, uh, that is due on Wednesday of this week. Uh, I'll put the link to the in the chat for you. Um, so that if you haven't completed that already, if you would do that, um, by Wednesday. I'd appreciate it. Susan, did you have something? I, I wanted to otherwise quickly mention. That was it. Go for it, Andre. Okay. Yeah, I was wanting to ask Sarah. So when people, if people are interested in, uh, in the uh, chair position or vice chair position, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, can they also just like call you, write you up, uh, write an email, call you up? Because you talked about a letter, you know, write us a letter if you want to, but that's very formal, right? Like well, if you that's, wanted, that's what we did the last time when we had those elections is that you had to have a letter written oh. to the committee as a whole about why you were interested. And so that won't be until, um, I think we talked about the possibilities of that being at the November convening, that we would vote in person at the November yes. convening, but we would like to have those letters ahead of time um to submit out to the to the committee as a whole so just so they had time to think about it so to speak yeah and what i in that's great and i was just trying to clarify the process before that you know so like before somebody is writing a letter mm -hmm. they're like i'm not sure whether i want this right reach mm -hmm. out to you is that fair oh say, sure like, yeah I, i'm okay. happy to answer any questions me kathy good. anybody um good. about about the processes and and what it involves i'll be fully honest um, uh, because it's, it is, um, something that I've really, really right. enjoyed this year. And I've learned a lot from this group. Cool. Okay. Well, y'all, we are ending this meeting before my four-year-old shows up like a tornado of havoc. So, uh, my husband is bringing him home now. So he's texting me that he's on his way. <laughs> So I'm glad to see you all. Um, have a great Labor Day weekend. If you're working for a school system, I hope you have a great start to the school year. Um, and we will see you and we'll be sending out that updated invite for September 11th. So talk to y'all later. Thanks Thank everyone. Bye-bye.